Hey, good morning, friends. So good uh, to see you. Happy Sunday. Uh, if you are new here, my name is Garrett. I'm the lead pastor here at Legacy Church. And I haven't, if I haven't gotten a chance to just get to know you, uh, I will meet you over. I'd love to meet you over at the coffee pot right outside for that is where his presence is most heavenly. So uh, I'd just love just to get to know you, just hear a bit of uh, your story. If you don't know, t- t- today we're continuing a series called Getting Past Your Past. And kind of last week we decided to do a little bit of work about thinking about our past, about thinking about you know growing up and thinking about the memories that kind of shape the person that we are today. And speaking of memories that shape the person that I am today, uh, one of my, not my, one of my, my closest childhood friend, uh, Jenner, and his uh, fiance Tessa, are here. And I'm really, really excited about it. Uh, they're here from San Diego, is where I grew up. Sorry, they don't live in San Diego anymore. I made this just for you, Jenner. You're so, you're so welcome. Literally, one of, <laughs> I love, <laughs> did I just do a joke for one person visiting? Yes, welcome to Legacy Church. Um, They're getting married here in just a few months, and I'm really excited about it. You all are invited. Uh, You all can come. (laughs) Just kidding. No, you're not. I'm just saying, my friends are here. Be on your best behavior, please, today. Um, just, I love you, man, Tessa. We love you so much, and uh, it's good, good, to have, good to have you with us. That's, I promise I won't mention you now for the rest of the, the whole sermon. I grew up with uh, Jenner at San Diego First Assembly uh, in church, and it's just uh, really when I do think about kind of the memories of growing up, I have a lot, a lot of fun, hilarious memories uh, with Jenner. And so um, kind of, again, the, the, the purpose of this series, and hopefully last week you, you kind of did the work of I'm going to spend some time this week. I'm going to, I'm going to be thinking through kind of my memories. And, and really, again, kind of the, the, the only thing we talked about last Sunday was, was talking about trying our best to answer the questions. Like what portions, what, what pieces of our past really shape the people that we are in the present? How many of you guys were here last Sunday as we kind of kicked off this series? Oh, great. So hopefully you did. You, you spent some time in meditation and in prayer kind of thinking through, you know, God, what are those memories? Because we all have memories have stuff. We all have events. And again, oftentimes they're, they're great memories that we don't want to get past. We want to hold on to. Things that really define who we are in a really fantastic, awesome way. But again, the purpose of this series is not to get over the good memories, but learning how to process the pain and the trauma of, of memories that, that shape us in a way. I know we, we all as humans had those experiences where we, we have things that, that happen in our lives and they just seem to kind of just pierce the soul in a way that it lingers for a while, that we can, we can revisit that memory, we can revisit that, that loss, that trauma, and, it, and it's just like it happened yesterday, even though for many of us it happened years, if not kind of decades ago. And so again, that, that's kind of my heart, that's what I've been praying for you and, and, and for, for me, to, to, to be frank, that, that we can spend time getting help and processing. And again, kind of the next three weeks we'll be talking about today is, is really all about grief and loss. Uh, next week we'll be talking about pain and trauma. And then the week after, I'm sorry, not next week. Next week is Mother's Day, and I'm so excited for that. Tiffany Riojas, I know Pastor Nick already talked uh, uh, about Mother's Day on Sunday, and it's so interesting because Tiffany has had this message on her heart for months now. She didn't even know this was the series we were going. We, we, I probably should have talked with you a little more, but she, she, she has such a phenomenal message for next Sunday that is so in line with what we're talking about in this series. It really is miraculous, and so uh, make sure you are here next Sunday for Mother's Day uh, to hear that powerful message from Tiffany. But uh, let me do this. Can you grab your phones, your Bibles, your app? I'm going to grab my notes here. And again, kind of the the, the purpose of today is we're we're talking about grief and loss. And I've been, gosh, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for us throughout this whole series that I know this tone, the kind of the subject matter is really painful. I am, I am asking you to do something tremendously brave and, and painful. It's, let's think about the memories in our past, the pain, the trauma, the grief, the loss, the shame, the regret. And instead of hiding it, which I think we're all prone to, that's just the human thing to do, let's bring it before God. Let's bring it into the community of faith here at Legacy Church And let's see what he can do as we process, as we grow. We talked a lot about therapy last week. As we spend time saying, God, this hurts and I really don't want it to anymore. And if we can all have a hope for our future that that the way you feel right now, the way pain defines you right now, that that I believe that that is not where God just wants to keep you, but, but 
processing and, and asking and taking that next step of, of healing through getting past our past, I really do believe God is going to work miracles uh, in our midst throughout this series. So let me, let me start again by that, that quote from an author playwright, James Baldwin. I just think it's, it's so powerful. Read this again with me. It says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And again, that's kind of my heart, that, that even though it is painful, even though it is awkward, even though it's bringing up emotions that you're really trying to just ignore and cope with, I think if we can face our past, we can really get past it. We can really have like this all this year, we're talking, it's a year of progress for us at Legacy Church, and I feel like so many of us, we're just in shackles to the pain and the trauma, the guilt, the grief that we've experienced in our past. And, and again, so today we're, we're kind of just a little vertical slice. We're going to be talking about grief and loss. But what, what I want to do is I really kind of want to define our terms here, because I think oftentimes when you think about loss, when you think about grief, I think kind of the, the definition that comes into your mind is, is so narrow that I think many of us would be like, well, this sermon isn't for me. Ah, I'm not really grieving right now. I don't know if I've experienced a loss. Not like they have. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about the different types of grief. And I want to let you know that, that a lot of this is taken from the Jed Foundation. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, Jed Foundation, it was a, it was a family that, that lost a son in the, in the mid-90s named Jed. And they started this nonprofit organization really to uniquely in schools and middle schools and high schools begin to talk about suicide awareness, to be able to talk about kind of mental health, the importance of, of therapy with students. And so this right here is all just taken from just the phenomenal work that they've done as an organization. So let, let, let's talk about grief. It's a chipper subject for you. Happy, happy Sunday. But let's talk about, again, just kind of the different types of grief. And I, I think everyone will find themselves here. Either you have experienced this before or you're currently experiencing this type of grief. So the, the first type of grief is what they call anticipatory grief. And this kind of grief, it comes before an event that we know is going to be emotionally challenging. It's kind of, again, the conflict, the emotions, the grief that happens in our hearts and our souls leading up to a loss or leading up to conflict. So, for example, someone that you know that you love receives a terminal diagnosis, and you, you'll begin to experience anticipatory grief, or you're, you're watching a relationship dissolve, you're watching a marriage head towards divorce, or you, you have an upcoming conversation and, and you know it's going to be bad, you know it's going to end in heart, heartache, it's going to have some conflict. This is what is known as anticipatory grief. It's all the emotions leading up to what feels inevitable. And the second one, I think this is kind of the most common one, it's just, it's just sudden grief. This comes from a sudden, unexpected loss. Of course, someone, someone dies unexpectedly. You go into work and you are let go. You are laid off. You had no plans <laughs> to be let go. This was, this was sudden. This is something like, like somebody cheated on you. You were betrayed. There was a relationship. That somebody, somebody abandoned you. You weren't prepared for it. There was no way to anticipate it. It was sudden. And it's, it's, it's a grief that you are still carrying this one was particularly eye-opening for me, and I, I think just because of how the last two years have been for us in our world due to COVID and pandemic and all the chaos that <laughs> ensued in our nation, I, I think uh, I'd be bold enough to say all of us in one way or another have experienced what they just call cumulative grief. And this is the kind of grief that occurs when we experience multiple losses close together, or it can also occur when we experience similar types of grief over and over on multiple occasions, and we've never really quite healed from the first loss, from the first moment of trauma. I've had this just in my own life. It, it, you'd love to just approach every situation, just what are the facts? Like, what is it on paper? But that's just not how our brains, our hearts, our souls are wired, that, that you're betrayed or, or someone you know, gossips about you, and then your anger, your emotion, it's just not that situation. It's the 15 other times it's happened to you before because you've never really been able to, to get healing and help from that, uh, from that trauma. It's just all kind of bound up in your heart. So again, so examples, uh, losing a loved one, and then having to move. Or again, I think COVID, for 
all of us, right? We had to deal with people moving out of California. We dealt both the families here or, I mean, I'm, I'm picturing the people that used to sit here with you, but they're not here anymore because they, they passed away to COVID. We all have stories like that. We, have, we had loved ones that drew lines in the sands. There were relationships that were broken, that were dissolved again. And all of that has all happened in a very, short amount of time and I think all of us are a limping we're limping just a little bit because of that kind of grief and loss and this last one here it's this one's quite peculiar because it, it, they just call it absent grief and this is the name for the grief that we feel like we're not having and so we put guilt and shame on ourselves because we're not grieving like we feel like we should. And sometimes this is just due to comparison. A loved one in your family passes away and someone else is, is grieving and you're like, why don't I feel like that? Why can't I talk like them? Why can't I cry like that? And, and this, one, this, one's, this one's a, a bit complex because sometimes, sometimes it's because of the anticipatory grief that you've experienced, that you know somebody was sick for years and so when they finally pass away, you handle it a little better than you thought you were going to, but then because of that, you feel shame and guilt because of it. Like, I'm not grieving like I should, but sometimes it's because you have been able to process this loss, but then of course sometimes as well, it's, it, it's absent because you're really not allowing yourself to heal. You feel like you need to be strong for every other person uh, in your family, and so you're, you're basically saying like, I'm just gonna push snooze on my soul for a few months or a few years or a few decades. And I want to be so clear because I'm worried like now that we've talked about the types of grief, everyone in here is depressed because you're like, I have so much grief and loss and I feel so bad about it now and apparently I'm not even grieving correctly. So, so uh, let, let, let me just be, make something really clear with you. And I hope this makes sense that uh, I feel like grief and loss and sadness and emotions and sobbing and tears and sleepless nights, I think it's an incredibly courageous and powerful, like dare I say, commendable thing. That when you and I experience grief and loss, it, it tells us, one, that, that we're human. It tells us that we loved someone deeply, that we really, truly cared. So I'm so worried, I've been praying against anyone saying, like, I'm trying to grieve and apparently I'm not even doing it correctly. That wherever you're at, and again, we have a lot more sermon to talk about, but I, but I really do believe that it, even though it is so painful, that, that grief really is powerful. Let, let me share with you this quote. This is from uh, Jamie Anderson. He's a director, writer, if you're a super nerd, yes, it's that Jamie Anderson of Doctor Who fame, but uh, it has nothing to do with doctors here. I just I love this quote. He says this, grief, I've learned, is really just love. It's all the love you want to give, but you can't. All that unspent love gathers up in the corners of your eyes, in the lump of your throat, and in the hollow part of your chest. This part here gets me. Grief is just love with no place to go. And I, again, I think that's why grief, it hurts so much. It reminds us how much we love, truly love one another. The brokenness in this world that, you know, that, that we believe like, like our bodies weren't meant to handle betrayal and death and, and cancer and loss. That's why it hurts so much. It reminds you that you're human. It reminds you that this world is broken. And it reminds you that the person or the way you feel, you, you truly, truly love them. And again, I don't think that's a sign of weakness. That's a sign of courage. That's a sign of strength. I'm grieving, I'm mourning so much. Why? Because that person meant so much to me. Because I have so much love in my heart and I don't know where to put it because they're not here anymore. Again, grief is just love that has no place to go. And so uh, what I, what I want to do now, this deserves its own Sunday. Uh, but again, this is, this is taken from the, the Jed Foundation. I'm sure many of you have heard of the four or the five stages of grief. And so, so what they've done is really kind of modified uh, that understanding of, of grief and really expanded it in a way that I really believe will be helpful. I hope this isn't triggering, but I hope all of us, to a certain extent, can 
kind of find ourselves. So instead of, instead of you know, four or five stages, they really talk about a cycle, a cycle of progress, a cycle of health, and it starts with loss. It starts with the trauma, and as you move forward, as you get help, day and day you get better and better, you really come to a, not, not full acceptance, but really adaptation. That you're able to kind of get your head above water and move forward with that grief and that loss. And I'm just going to hit this very briefly. We will post this on Facebook and Instagram, but you guys know my love language. When you take pictures of the TVs, it just, it just warms my heart as a pastor. And I'll just kind of go through this very, very quickly. So again, kind of first we have, we have shock. That initial just like out-of-body experience of like, am, am I dreaming? Is this a nightmare? What is, what is, is this a really bad movie? We don't know how to process. We don't know how to speak. We're just in shock. And it seems like kind of that, that heightened sense goes to low sense where you go from shock to numbness, from numbness to denial, uh, to, from I'm realizing my notes aren't, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk here or else I'm gonna miss something. Uh, denial and then anger and disorganization. They talk a lot about kind of in that anger and disorganization, everything in your life is disorganized. Your schedule, your, they talk a lot about emotional outbursts and it's not because you're angry at the people around you, it's just because they're the closest thing to you and you don't know how to move forward. That There's this shock and numbness, denial, anger, kind of emotional outbursts and disorganization followed, followed by panic that leads us into loneliness. And they talked about kind of loneliness kind of shoots off into just full isolation where you don't want to spend time with anyone, you don't want to see anyone, but then also there's guilt because you don't want to see anyone, you don't want to spend time with anyone, and you, 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 you put all this expectation on yourself that I should be better. They texted me, I should go get coffee with them. I know they want to hear how I'm doing, but again, you're just not ready for that. And let me get ahead of myself a bit. Um, these this is not uh, steps, this is a journey, this is a cycle, and so if you're in the middle, if you're like, I feel like I'm at anger right now, don't hear, so then by tomorrow you better be by uh, re-entry issues. No, like our journey like, will look like this, won't it? Anybody who's ever experienced grief and loss, it's not just here's this 12 steps and, and I'm totally fine, but it's again, every day it changes and sometimes you move backwards, sometimes you move forward, and again, that's okay as long as you tell yourself, I'm going to move forward. So after isolation, Again, we have depression, and then we have kind of re-entry issues. Those are just like when you're, you're t you take a next step, you go grab coffee with that person, you go and spend time with them, and then you realize afterwards that you just weren't quite ready for that. That was a little too, hey, that was a little too, uh, I'm so excited. You want to come help me preach my sermon? Hi, baby. Hey. My sermon's really sad, but you're like the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. <laughs> She's like, I see you at school all the time, huh? <laughs> Anyways, hey Hannah, good morning. Um, and then again, after kind of we're processing, we're trying to figure it out. <laughs> hey girl. <laughs> um, we're kind of building new relationships. Maybe you find someone, you so want to come up here, don't you? Here. Here, I'm going to take your hand, okay? Can I take your hand? You want to go back to mama? She's like, No. You want to come play the drums? Yeah? Remind me her name. Aliana. Aliana, hey. You want to take my hand? You want to take you back to mama? You know, she's like, I've come to preach. The Lord has put... I was on the cool part of the church. Okay. I know. She's like, hey, he's from, he's from school. And again, with, with new relationships, we have new patterns. We have new strengths. We have new habits. We have hope. We have affirmations that you're telling, you know what? I got through that. There were moments in my life where it felt like I, I was... I didn't want to move forward. I didn't want to get better. But you begin to tell yourself, I am stronger today. And then I, th I think, again, I think one of the most beautiful gifts that you can give the world to kind of not make sense, but to at least do something with the grief and the loss that you've experienced is to begin to help others. And I think that's such the beauty that, that, of what the church can be. 
is that we, we say it so, like it's a joke that like no, per, no perfect people allowed at Legacy Church. If you feel perfect, there might be another church you'll fit into, but you will not fit in here. We're just a bunch of broken people trying our best to follow Jesus. And I hope in that, that we, 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 we start with the gospel that says you and I don't have it all together. You and I couldn't figure it out in ourselves. That's why our God is so good. And that's hopefully what the community of faith can do for one another. You've experienced loss. You've experienced trauma. You've experienced a sudden death in the family. Come sit next to me. And let's talk. And let's weep. And let's pray. And let's tell ourselves we're going to get better one day at a time. And there is grace and there is hope in the meantime. It's okay that you're not okay right now. Again, too often Christians, we just try and mask our feelings. Every, every day is a blessing. Rejoice in the Lord always. But we, like, we know your, your bones are broken. It's okay that you're still healing. It's okay that you're still angry. You're still processing. It's okay that you don't want to talk about it right now. Again, I hope there's space for, for, for us to be fully ourselves in the presence of God and one another. So how, how does Jesus fit into our grief? How, how does he fit in to the loss that is so deeply human? I, I want to share with you what is probably a very familiar story from John chapter 11. If you do have your Bibles, turn, you can turn me to John chapter 11. And in, in this, I want to kind of, I want to do two things here. I, I want you to see Jesus. I want you to see how he enters into someone's worst day, enters into the grief, enters into the loss. And both, of course, as, as, as the people here that are grieving, I hope you see a Savior that loves you and understands. And, but also, I think there's so much that, that you and I can glean about how to love and support someone who's grieving. Both how we can grieve with Jesus and also how we can be Jesus to someone else and help them and support them in that process of grief. So this is going to be John chapter 11. We'll begin right uh, at verse 1. This is a long story. I, I skipped, just for sake of time, a few verses. Go back and read the whole story. It's so great. It's so powerful. There's some rather humorous, hilarious moments. But uh, this is what we read again. John 11, we'll begin right at verse 1. It says this. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This is Mary, whose brother Lazarus, now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, and I don't want you to miss this. Again, we see that Jesus has had multiple interactions with this family. He knows them well. He's close to them. And the word is sent that Lazarus is sick. He's terminally sick. He is dying. And so they're looking for Jesus. He's in Bethany, and he hears this, and don't miss this. It says, Lord, the one you love is sick. And I got to give a shout out uh, to, to, to Kyle Favel, who leads our food pantry. He's on the board. I've read this verse before, you know, kind of like theologically, but as long as I've known Kyle, especially at the food pantry, you hear so many prayer requests, so many opportunities for people to feel the tangible love of God as you're just spending time praying with them, weeping with them. But he often will quote that right there when praying for someone. And to me, especially, like, I'm not even going to try because it comes from Kyle and it's so powerful and so personal that when someone says, you know, my dad has cancer, you know what my, you know, we, we, they're fighting COVID right now. And I've heard Kyle over and over and over again say, Lord, the one you love is sick. It is so powerful and personal to me, and I, and, I, and I hope this doesn't feel a little too on the nose for you, but I want, I want you to know that you are the one that Jesus loves, and the person that you are praying for, and you're beginning to doubt his goodness in this situation, I want you to know that they also are the one that Jesus loves. Maybe we can all just kind of take a cue from Kyle Favel, and in those moments, start there. And, and I want you to know, when you say, hey, Lord, the one whom you love is sick, you're not reminding him. <laughs> I think oftentimes we need to remind ourselves. Thus, we feel like he is distant and unconcerned, apathetic, you know, if not a, a bit smiling at our suffering and grief. That is not our Savior. Lord, the one who you love is sick. 
And now, again, I'm going I'm to jump a few verses here. We're going to go to 3 to 16. Again, if you have time this week, feel, please, please, please read. Read the Bible. That'd be a good thing. That's probably a, a, something a pastor should say, right? Maybe, maybe read the Bible every now and then, you know, when you're feeling like it. So, but I, I missed uh, some, some, some kind of a, a funny story here. So what Jesus says is, is he, he, again, he waits two more days in Bethany, and then Lazarus dies. And then Jesus says that, hey, you know, this sickness is not going to lead to death. Lazarus is just Asleep, And this is kind of a metaphor that Jesus is speaking of, saying like, no, no, for the Savior, death is of no consequence. I'm going to resurrect Lazarus. He's not dead. He's just asleep. And it's funny because the dim-witted disciples give me a lot of hope for my own life. They're basically like, Lazarus just taking a nap? And it's not that big of a deal, Jesus. There's no reason. Why would we heal him from his nap? And then Jesus has to say, no, he did. That's a paraphrase. He doesn't really say that. And then they all begin to spiral out of control. And he's like, okay, come on, I'm going to go heal him. Let's go. And so we'll kind of pick up uh, in John chapter 11 with all of the disciples panicking because they were like, wait, what? He's not sleeping? He's really dead? And you were just using a metaphor? Oh, no. Read this with me. It says this in verse 16. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, Stick with Thomas, bro. Uh, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with them. Hear how, hear how full of faith the disciples are? What? Lazarus is dead? Then let's go die with him. And on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the, for the loss of their brother. So picture this. They sent word, Jesus, please come, Lazarus is sick. Jesus stays for two days, Lazarus dies. Jesus shows up in the middle of the funeral. And uh, Christian, hear me here. I want you to see Mary and Martha and how they respond to Jesus because I hope, I hope it gives us a vocabulary of honesty that we can, we can approach the doubt and the anger and the grief and the loss because again, they're in the middle of mourning and grieving Lazarus. They begged Jesus to come, and he shows up days later in the middle of the funeral. And it says this in verse 20. It says, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. I think just right there, there's so much there that Jesus has come and Martha goes to meet him, but Mary, so full of grief, and I'm going to get ahead of myself, and Jesus not once like, goes like, really, you weren't going to come and see me? He even has grace for Mary that's like, I don't even want to see Jesus right now. I don't want to talk to Jesus right now. She stayed home, and Martha comes, and again, like, I, I, I hope you hear her words like you audibly hear the timbre of her voice as she weeps, as she sobs, as, as I mean, I think as she raises her voice in anger at Jesus. It says this. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Do you hear the anger? Do you hear the doubt? Do you hear the frustration, the amount of honesty that God is like? Because I'll spoil it for you. Jesus doesn't go, how dare you speak to me? I'm the Messiah. He doesn't do that. He enters right into it with her. And she says, we ask you to come. Man, how familiar does this, does this feel, believers in Christ? We prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we expected and we decreed and we did our best and it didn't happen. If you had been here, it wouldn't happen this way. I want you to see the amount of honesty that Martha, just in the Bible, allows us to grieve this way. And that our, our God is not afraid of our anger and our doubt and our frustration and our honesty. Like, God, this is the way I feel. I'm not even going to try and come up with the right words. I'm just angry at you. He's infinite. He can handle it. You're not going to offend him. He just wants to spend time with you. She says, if you would have been here, you would not have died. And here, here like this, this <laughs> cut in half mustard seed side of faith. She says, but I know even now, God will give you whatever you ask. She says, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Still, I believe you can do whatever you want. But he's here. Welcome to the funeral. 
Again, I think Martha is giving us so much, and I, I, I pray, I'm going to hit through this briefly because I'm, I'm looking at the time now. I'm hoping that we can learn to grieve like Martha and Mary. Uh, Mary's about to become a part of the story. She, she, she comes in later, but I think just in these, in these just few verses, I think there's a lot that we can glean about how to biblically, with God, and in, with, with, with time, and giving ourselves grace, how we can grieve well, if you will. So the first thing is this. I hope again you take pictures, write notes. I think Martha gives us space to be honest and open with God. To be angry at God. To, to talk our doubts through with God. Our frustration with God. Again, just in a few weeks ago, we talked a lot about kind of how the, this existence, earth, we, you know, we believe this ain't it. There is brokenness, there is suffering, that there is pain. We're gonna talk a whole lot more about that, kind of why there's suffering in the world next week in this series. But I think right here that Martha, you, hopefully you saw her brokenness. She's like, we told you to be here and you didn't show up and now he's dead. Again, I think she's giving us so much freedom and boldness to be honest and open with God. Again, second, to be gentle and to be patient with yourself. Sometimes, it's like we talk about, sometimes there's that shock and then there's just numbness. And if you can just tell yourself, that's the way I feel right now today. And I think oftentimes, especially kind of for religious, like Christian people, we often want to just try and deny how we're feeling because we feel bad that we feel that way. And all you're doing is just kind of burying that down even further. Just say, I don't feel good right now. I am very upset right now. I just want to sit in bed and I don't even want to exist right now. If you tell that to yourself and tell yourself, that's the way I feel today, and I'm going to embrace and be like, that's okay, I'm aware of that, and give yourself grace to say, I may not feel that way tomorrow, but I feel that way today. I think that's so much more healthy than, again, just trying to deny or to cope with how you feel. Again, think in cycles, not steps. It's not going to be linear. It's going to be all over the place. And again, if you tell yourself that, then you're giving yourself both the hope of progress tomorrow and grace today. That I'm going to be open with God. I'm going to be gentle and patient with myself. I'm going to think in cycles, not steps. Again, you're not, you're not going to compare your process to someone else. They seem to be doing great. What is my problem? Why am I so frustrated right now? Why, why am I experiencing so much trauma? Again, you have no idea what they're dealing with. And I think one of the things that Satan would love to do is that you've experienced grief and loss, and then what you do is you compare how you're processing that grief and loss to someone else. Don't do that. Gather loving, trusted friends. I think, again, there's a beautiful illustration that the, the whole town kind of shut down to go to mourn and grieve and to help Mary and Martha. All the Jews, it said, that gathered around, gathered loving, trusted friends. Again, understand that grief, and this is an important word, often, not always, but grief often leads to meaning and strength. Let me, let me ask, this is a bull, this is a, I know it's a bold question to ask, but I want you to raise your hand if you've experienced loss and grief that was horrible, horrible, horrible. But in those moments, you learn more about God and you learn more about yourself or you were able to help someone else because of the horrible trauma. If you've experienced that, please, okay, whoa. Okay, keep, keep them up, sorry, keep them up. Keep them up, keep them up, now look around. That's the beauty of the church. We, we, we went through horrible things that we would not wish on our worst enemy. It was horrible and horrible. But in those moments, God was close, and I learned some things. And I never want to go through that again, but I am thankful that I did learn what I learned. And now I'm able to help. Again, understand that grief often leads to meaning and strength. Now, believe you've you got to believe that you'll get through this, even when it feels like you won't. Let's keep on reading. Just the next verse in verse 23. It says, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, it's interesting, she's like, yeah, 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 I know Jesus. She said, I, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah. I do believe that you are the son of God who has come into the world. I think, I, think, I think Martha's saying right there, I'm not okay right now, but I'm going to believe that I'm going to 
be okay. I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm not okay, but I'm, I'm going to believe that I'm going to get better one day at a time. It says this, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, this is Mary now, she fell at his face and she said the same thing. They obviously had been talking before Jesus showed up. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And don't miss this. It says that when Jesus saw her weeping, and the whole town, the Jews that had, had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit, and he was troubled. And he says, again, this is Jesus. A few verses ago, he was like, yeah, Lazarus is sick. He's going to die, but that's okay. I'm going to use this to glorify me. This sickness is not going to lead to death. He's just asleep. He shows up, knows what's going to happen. He sees everyone weeping and mourning, and he is troubled, and his spirit is moved. He felt an aching in his heart, the Savior of the world, and he says, where have you laid him? She says, come and see, Lord. I'm sure many of us know, shortest verse in the Bible. And Jesus wept. This has always been one of the most beautiful, worshipful paradoxes for me, because Jesus knows what's going to happen. He says a few, for you verses prior that Lazarus, he says that everything, he explains it, yet when he gets there, his spirit is moved and he weeps. Picture Jesus weeping with all the others. Picture Jesus. And I want you to, I, want, I hope this lands on you like, it, like it's just landed on me time and time again. Jesus' divinity doesn't diminish his sympathy that he can be both all-loving and all-powerful. In the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your grief, in the midst of your doubt and uncertainty, we do not serve a God that's like, you're sad about it? I don't even know what that feels like. What, you're grieving? You're weeping? Well, stop it, don't you know that I'm God? Jesus, fully God, fully man, knows what's going to happen, steps into the grief and sorrow, and weeps with his creation. We do not serve a God that doesn't know what, it's feel, what it feels like to have a heart broken, to have someone die unexpectedly, to expect things to get better, but to watch. We talked about it last week. He was betrayed. He has suffered. But I want you to picture Jesus holding you and weeping with you, not wondering why you're weeping. Don't you have faith? Crying, no. Jesus wept. He has full divinity and empathy, ah, I should, I should have said empathy, not sympathy, that's so much better. Jesus is, he's fully divine, yet also with us, suffering with us. Psalm 34, 18 says this, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. And we, we, we already talked about, we are, we are, you already saw the hands up of all of the people that have experienced tremendous loss. They were brokenhearted. And they felt God close. They felt God rescue them. Now, I'm, I'm going to hit this briefly, but I also think it's very important for, for us to kind of work on our EQ when it comes to helping, supporting, and caring for those that are experiencing grief and loss. Because I've seen a lot of people do the wrong thing with the right motives. And I've seen a lot of people, in the name of just not knowing any better, really adding to the grief and loss in the name of just trying to help somebody who is experiencing tremendous grief and loss. So let's learn how to love and support like Jesus. Again, I'm just going to hit this uh, very briefly. I think the first thing that Jesus shows us is that when you're walking with, you're spending time, you're trying to support someone who, is, who has experienced tremendous grief and loss, I think one of the greatest things you can do is you just fully give them your heart and your ears. You just spend time with them. Oftentimes, they don't need you to speak. They just need you to be there, to hug them, to cry with them, to listen. I, I mean, just I've seen moment after moment with, with, with Pastor Rick, my lead, but Pastor Rick Comstock. In those situations, it's just like there's no, there's no, there's no sermon to give. You just sit with them and you just weep with them and you just give them your heart and you give them your ears. I think it's also important that in those moments that we absorb their anger and their doubts. You notice Jesus the Messiah doesn't argue with Martha. Don't, don't you know? Go and read the few verses prior to the story that's happening right now. I am going to raise Lazarus. No, he absorbs it. 
He's big enough to handle it. And I think oftentimes people need to just verbalize what's on their mind. And the, the, the worst thing you could do is try to argue with them. Oh, well, don't you know all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes? Like, I will punch you on their behalf. Like, that's the last thing that they need. They just need to be listened to. And again, with that, I realize now I'm getting ahead of myself. You don't argue. You don't theorize. You don't sermonize. Like, listen, you know what? You know, here's my three-point sermon about the loss of your great-great-grandmother. No, all you need to do is just be there for them to absorb their anger. Don't argue with them. Don't theorize. Don't sermonize. Because, I mean, I, I, like, I, I know it's weird to be like, hey, as a pastor, don't give them a Bible verse. But we all know, like, it just feels way too, like, you're like, here's a fortune cookie. Sorry for your loss. Like, that's what it feels like in the moment. They want a real human to be able to grieve with them. And again, we see that from Jesus. Jesus doesn't go like, sit down, Martha. Let me redo the Sermon on the Mount just for you. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. No, he, he, <laughs> he listens. He weeps with them. You can help them practically and thoughtfully. Sometimes people like to, you know, our church is so great about meal trains and doing stuff like that and helping people or kind of like, why we can go clean your house, we can clean, again, thoughtfully, because there's some people that were like, oh, we would love that if you, if our house is clean, that'd be amazing. There are some people that are like, if you go into my house right now, I will murder you because I don't want you in my house, you know, so it's just, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta think practically and thoughtfully. Again, when appropriate, when appropriate, laugh. I think sometimes there's something so boldly defiant when we can laugh in the face of tragedy. If we can laugh in the face of the sorrow and loss that we still feel. And again, this is really practical. I just feel like oftentimes in churches, we're not very good at this. Check in with them after the burial service. Check in with them after the funeral. I think sometimes when we're not close to the person who passed away, we went to the service. We were right here. We went to the funeral, and it's like, okay, we've grieved, but you know they're not, they're not done grieving. They're not done hurting. Oftentimes, that service is really when they begin to start the process of grieving. They've been in, in shock and numbness, and they've been having to figure out all the, the details of getting the service ready, and so kind of oftentimes when the service happens, it's when it hits for the first time, and often they need us later kind of more than ever to be able to just check in with them. All right, let, let's, uh, let's end this sermon. Let me just, next verse right here in verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. And it was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. He said, take away the stone. But Lord said, Martha, now this is weird. I got to say, this is weird. Uh, C.S. Lewis often talked about, you know, he, he kind of studied mythology, Greek mythology. And he would say, like, the Bible doesn't read like myth because there's all these extra details in the, in, in the verses that just, if you were like once upon a timing it, you just wouldn't add these details. And so this detail here is weird. And if you're a little bit sick and twisted like me, it's just a little bit humorous. But again, it's in the Bible, and my job as a pastor is to read the Bible. So she said, he said, move the stone away. And it said, but Lord, said the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor. King James Version says, Lord, he stinketh. You're welcome. That's for free. He has been there for four. I'm so happy you laughed. If it was just dead quiet, I'd fire myself. I'm just like, but Lord, he stinketh. Uh, he has been in there for four days. Then Jesus said, "Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God?" So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, "Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you've always you always hear me. But I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me." And when he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, "Lazarus." Come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And I love this. This just this what Jesus says here really spoke to me. I hope it does to you. He says, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. And what I see here, and hopefully you see, like we just had Easter. Like, man, this Lazarus story, it feels like it's foreshadowing a little something, you know? Somebody was dead for a few days. There was a stone. They roll away the stone. He came on out. Like, well, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if there's a little bit of, you know, foreshadowing here. Yes, of course. It's all over the place. This was, this was, 
typifying. This was showing us, and then kind of God just kind of showing his hand to remind us what it's all about. That he's like, no, this is what Christ will do for all of us, that he will suffer, that he will die, and he will rise again in victory. And what, what, kind of, what, I, what I visualized for all of us, and we've talked about this a lot. We talked about this in James as well when we, when we concluded the book of James, that I want you to picture Mary and Martha in the grief. And of course, they experience just a few days of grief, four days of grief, and then they, they are reunited with their brother. But again, as Christians, as believers, we, 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 one, we believe that this, this ain't it. This, this isn't all there is, but there will come a day, there will come a day in paradise with God that we will be unified just like Mary and Martha were with their brother. So I want to, I want to, to lean in and again give you hope today that things are going to get better, but we are moments away from reunion. That I believe that through Jesus Christ, that again, no tear is wasted, no grief, no loss, no trauma, that there will come a day that we are reunited with those whom we love and whom we lost. That through Jesus, that we are moments away from that beautiful reunion. And so I'm, I'm hoping today, why don't you stand with me, Tim and the team, you guys can come on back, I'll, I'll close out. Um, I, wanna, I wanna read to you a, a, a short poem that really spoke to me. But I, I'm hoping that in, in, in the meantime before that reunion, where right now all we have is our grief, all we have are our memories, all we have is the loss, all we have is that love that has no place to go, that we would say, God, I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not healthy right now. And again, to give yourself the grace to verbalize that. I'm in pain right now. I'm frustrated at you right now. But I don't want to stay this way anymore. I, I don't want to be like this for the rest of my life. I want to be able to move forward. I want to be able to process. I want to be able to, I need to sit down and talk to a therapist. I need to sit down and have somebody pray for me. And as you saw, there's so many people in this church that have experienced so much pain, so much loss, so much trauma. And hopefully they are, they are monuments, living testimonies of his power and strength that we can overcome. So I, 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 I can picture God saying to you, what would it look like for you to begin to take off the grave clothes? What would it look like for you to be able to take off just one day at a time all the grief, all the loss? Not that, hey, it'll never hurt anymore. But it's like, I want to get better. I want to be able to move just from the loss and the numbness and the pain and the anger and the isolation, and the denial to new habits and new strengths and new friends and new relationships to helping other, to being a living testimony of his grace and his power in your life. But let, let, me, let me end with this. I know this is a bit of an odd ending. It just, it spoke to me so much. I threw it in my Todoist app months ago and said, week two of this series, I'll end with this. I think this is so beautiful. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a poem called All Is Well. Uh, it's by an old pro professor from Ox, not Oxnard, Oxford. Those are two very different things. <laughs> <laughs> professor at Oxnard, you say? Oh, no. Uh, professor at, at Oxford is a professor of theology. And he lost a loved one. I believe he wrote this when someone lost their daughter. And it's written from the perspective of, this, of the person that we are grieving speaking to us, which we know they can't. But it's the person we've lost, the person that we are grieving speaking to us, speaking to you. And I, I, hope, I hope this gives you hope, again, in the life to come. And the idea that, listen, you, you are going to get better. You're going to get through this. I know this is, this is a bit weird, but to me, like this beautiful poem, it just like, it, 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 it personifies that grief with the face of the person that we've lost saying, listen, you're going to be okay. Like them telling you, I know I'm gone, but I'm not gone forever. I know you're hurting, but you won't be hurting forever. But how about you cherish the time that we had? And I want you to know, again, the title is, all is well. Tim, could you just play just a little bit and I'll close out in prayer. He says this, all is well. Death is nothing at all. I have 
only slipped into the next room. I am I and you are you, whatever we were to each other that we are still. You can call me by my old familiar name. Speak to me in the easy way which you always used. Put no difference in your tone. Wear no forced air of solemnity or sorrow. Laugh as we always laughed at the little jokes we enjoyed together. Play and smile and think of me and pray. Let my name be ever the household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without effect, with the, without the trace of shadow in it. Life means all that it ever meant. It is the same as it ever was. There is unbroken continuity. Why should I be out of mind just because I'm out of sight? I'm waiting for you for an interval. Somewhere very near. I am just around the corner. And all is well. Let me pray over you. God, I, I pray that you would give us the strength to grieve. That you would create the relationships in this church that we can grieve and mourn together. I think many of us, we just need to be honest with ourselves and with you. Stop trying to just bury it down. and We have some understanding that you wanted us to be the strongest person. No, you are. And we're allowed to be weak. We're allowed to be frustrated. We're allowed to grieve. We're allowed to be angry. I pray that you would help this church to, to learn how to love and support people that are grieving better. Because I feel like oftentimes, because we don't want to enter into that grief, we kind of basically say, call me when you're better. Call me when you're done being sad. May we, have, may we be a church that is bold enough and brave enough and have hearts big enough to step into the grief and the loss and the weeping, just like you did, Jesus. And again, I pray as we follow you and as we trust you that we would choose health, we would choose healing, we would choose forgiveness, we would choose wholeness, we would choose strength day after day after day, and we would give ourselves grace in the meantime. I thank you, Jesus, that you promise we don't have to do this all by ourselves, but you're with us and you've given us the body of believers to help us. We thank you, Jesus, in your name.